The world must awaken out of its stupor and go further to meet the sun of the morning. In going further to meet the sun and awakening out of its stupor, the world would sometime have an understanding of itself and its purpose. Please continue watching for the teachings of the Rosicrucian Order. Välkomna! That is how the peaceful people of the Åland Islands would greet you with welcome in Swedish, the official language of the archipelago. Kind viewers, I am Mila. The citizens of the beautiful Åland Islands wish your lives to be filled with divine joy and happiness in God's eternal embrace. Welcome to Light, Illumination and the Law of Change from the Sanctuary of Self, Rosicrucian Order, Library, Part 1 of 2, on Words of Wisdom. The ancient mystical order Rosicrucius, also known as the Rosicrucian Order, AMORC, is a worldwide cultural, educational, and philosophical organization that is perpetuating the profound and practical teachings of the Rosicrucians. These teachings, as passed down and added to over the centuries, from ancient Egypt to Europe and now all over the world, pertain to the mysteries of the universe, nature, and humans themselves. The Rosicrucian Library is a source of spiritual wisdom and insight that includes the important writings by the respected imperators of the order such as Dr. Harvey Spencer Lewis, Ralph M. Lewis, and Christian Bernard. Today we will read from Fraser Ralph M. Lewis's book, The Sanctuary of Self, in Chapter 6 entitled Light and Illumination. We'll learn about the nature of darkness and light, and how, throughout history, those opposites were understood in comparison to how they are interpreted in the Rosicrucian order today. Light and Illumination Of all the contraries in nature, the opposites, light and darkness, are the most obvious. To the primitive mind, both light and darkness have a positive quality. Darkness has as much actuality to the primitive mind as does light. Some myths of primitive peoples represent light as being created out of the nature of darkness, but these are comparatively few. There are many experiences which are common to light and which we are accustomed to associate with the word light. By means of light, all of those things which constitute our visual world have existence to us. Even dangers are tangible, definite things in light, because they can be perceived. Their visual form depends upon light. When we open our eyes, light pours in and with it comes vision and all of those scenes, events and circumstances which we associate with light. Conversely, when we close our eyes or when the sun is veiled by clouds or by the curtain of night, darkness comes and with darkness all of those things which we have known and which we have associated with light disappear. In darkness there lurks terror for the unbridled imagination. Things can be conceived but not perceived. In death also there is no objective vision but only darkness. Thus, darkness symbolizes death and oblivion. In Egypt, darkness and light were not conceived alone, as two different qualities but as two different forces, like poles of a magnet. We know that the god Ra was symbolized by the sun and represented the positive, creative force of the sun. Darkness was symbolized by the god Set. It represented inertia in contrast to the activity related to the power of the sun. Consequently, darkness was a negative state. 
In fact, the Egyptians referred in their psalms to the sun forcing its way through the billowing clouds of darkness of night to emerge in the dawn, indicating that darkness was considered an inert opposition to the active forces of light. In the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, it is said, Let there be light. Then we are told that God divided light from darkness. This very definitely indicates that darkness and light were considered by the ancient Hebrews as separate creations. It also indicates that the light of day was considered a physical condition and was referred to in that sense. The great light, with its mystical and allegorical significance, was not included in this reference, because later we are told that God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens, and this referred to the stars and the moon, the lesser light. It concerned physical light, not a metaphor or an allegory. The symbolism of light and darkness in the moral sense does not definitely appear in the Bible until the New Testament, several centuries after the books of the Old Testament. There, darkness is made to represent concealment. Under cover of darkness, most crimes are committed. Consequently, darkness takes on the moral equivalent of evil. Conversely, light represents action in the open, things frankly and honestly done. So light is symbolically associated with goodness and virtue. Then we are told that our eyes may be open and our vision may be good, and yet we may not see. This implies that the mind is closed, that the mind is in darkness. Therefore, ignorance also becomes associated with darkness. Wisdom is related to light and to the open and searching mind. It is often said that those who search for knowledge and for learning are dwellers in light. It naturally follows that light is commonly held to be synonymous with learning and knowledge. In fact, there are a number of fraternal organizations today who oblige their candidates or applicants for membership to state in their applications that they are searching for light before they can be admitted. It is meant that they are searching for knowledge and for further learning. However, the mystics of old had a far different conception of light. To them, it did not mean merely knowledge and learning. The mystics and the Rosicrucians of today also distinguish between light and illumination. The distinction is a fine one, but worthy of our comprehension. Our eyes may be open and our vision good, and we may see things which we have never seen before, consequently we have knowledge of their existence. Yet, having seen these things and knowing that they are, they may seem without purpose to us. We are still puzzled, still in doubt about them, and therefore our visual experience has little value to us. For example, we may be shown a large and complicated piece of machinery or laboratory apparatus. Our vision of it is quite clear. We can describe what we see, as well as the one who has pointed out the machinery to us. And yet, it is still puzzling and confusing. We may, therefore, have perceptual light, an accumulation of facts, and yet remain very much mentally in the dark. Consequently, to the mystics, illumination means understanding. One may travel in light. Thus, one may be a searcher for knowledge, for new and strange facts, an unearther of information, a prober into tomes, and yet that is not sufficient. He must, with all of his light, eventually attain illumination or comprehension. In the Confessio Fraternitatis, which was one of the earliest public works issued by the Rosicrucian order in the 17th century, there was a statement to the effect that the world must awaken out of its stupor and go further to meet the sun of the morning. Now, during those days, there was an interest in knowledge and in learning. 
Men had vision, they could see, and many of them sought light. But the confessio meant more than that. It meant that, in going further to meet the sun and awakening out of its stupor, the world would sometime have an understanding of itself and its purpose. Certainly, today's humanity is still greatly in need of understanding, even with all of the light and knowledge which we have. In the Rosicrucian studies, it is said that illumination follows a period of meditation. This meditation is a deliberation upon the knowledge which a Rosicrucian student has acquired from the degrees of his study. Consequently, it proves that illumination is understanding, a something which must follow knowledge. One of the Rosicrucian degrees is known as the Illuminati. It means that, at that time, the student's consciousness, the various aspects of his consciousness, should be imbued with an understanding of that which he has studied. We therefore should make profound comprehension our goal in life not just a greater fount of knowledge or a greater accumulation of external things and facts. Light to the mystic always means illumination. Welcome to Light, Illumination and the Law of Change from the Sanctuary of Self, Rosicrucian Order Library Part 2 of 2 on Words of Wisdom. The ancient mystical order Rosicrucius, also known as the Rosicrucian Order AMORC, is a worldwide cultural, educational, and philosophical organization that is perpetuating the profound and practical teachings of the Rosicrucians. These teachings, as passed down and added to over the centuries, from ancient Egypt to Europe and now all over the world, pertain to the mysteries of the universe, nature, and humans themselves. The Rosicrucian Library is a source of spiritual wisdom and insight that includes the important writings by the respected imperators of the order such as Dr. Harvey Spencer Lewis, Ralph M. Lewis, and Christian Bernard. Let us now continue with the reading of the next chapter 7 in the Sanctuary of Self by Fraser Ralph M. Lewis entitled Death, the Law of Change. We will learn about the Rosicrucian Order's view and explanation on death and its essence. Death, the Law of Change The ancient philosopher Epicurus stated, why should man concern himself so much about death and fear it? For by so doing he presumes to know the nature of death or the circumstances which surround the transition from life to death. Since man does not know these things, he should not dread death, not live in fear of it. He should not attempt to anticipate the unknown. When the end, the unknown, comes to us, it is then the known, and the thing that is known is never feared. Why do most men fear death? Is it not because they dislike to relinquish the pleasures, the joys, the rewards, the power, fame, and position they have attained in life? But if they fear to relinquish these things, if they fear that death will rob them of these pleasures, they must also realize that death will deny them pain, deny them worry, grief, and strife. For if death checks one experience in life, it will check all of them. Let us consider death as being like the act of crossing the threshold into another room. When the chamber that we are in becomes crowded and no longer is able to serve our purposes, and the door is flung open, and we see through the portal the room for further expression, why should we hesitate to avail ourselves of it, especially when it affords an opportunity which the crowded chamber of the present may not? The soul of man is of the one universal soul, the intelligence of God, which flows as a spiritual efficacy through all men alike. 
We may again use an analogy which we have often used. The soul force is like an electric current which flows through a circuit of electric lamps. It causes each lamp in the circuit to manifest light and color, each differently perhaps. Yet the essence of all the lamps, the current, is the same. This soul force within man has, or shall we say, engenders certain attributes. The principal one is known as the psychic body. This cosmic intelligence or soul force is not confined to one area, section or organ of the body, as many philosophers once thought. Rather, it permeates each cell of the matrix of cells of which the human organism is composed. Each cell has its duties, its functions, which contribute to the whole purpose for which the human body exists. Therefore, as the cells in their protoplasmic substance compose the physical form, for example, of the heart, the psychic consciousness of those same cells comprises a psychic body or that which corresponds to the physical form of the heart, namely, a psychic heart. At death or that transition, which separates the body and the spiritual qualities or soul forces of man. What happens then to the psychic body? The soul, of course, is drawn into the universal soul from which it was never detached. For analogy, we ask the question, what happens to the electric current? When you turn off a light or switch off an electric fan, the current still exists, ready to manifest again when the material connection has been provided. The psychic body, or self of a human, is only absorbed into the universal soul. It is not lost. Rather, it harmonizes with all of the personalities and the psychic bodies that go to make the one cosmic soul. Again, we ask a question to further our point. What happens to the colors, red, green, and blue, when there is no medium, such as a prism, to diffuse white light? The wavelengths of those colors are all blended together to make that harmony of all the colors of which white light consists. So it is with the psychic bodies and personalities in the universal soul. Just prior to the last breath, on the occasion of transition, the psychic body projects itself, that is, it seems to extend a few feet from the physical body. It is not liberated, it still is bound to the physical body by the silver cord, a traditional mystical term for that essence of the psychic body which remains attached to the living physical body. The greatest essence of the psychic body at such a time can be sensed, or rather, I should say, perceived as a cloud or haze. Sometimes it is in the form of an oval from an end of which there is seen to descend the silver cord as a kind of spiral or vapor. The smallest end of the spiral appears to enter the body at the solar plexus. With transition, therefore, there ends on this plane the consciousness of self and awareness of any irritation. From the Rosicrucian concept, cremation is the ideal manner in which to dispose of the body, the physical element of which the body is composed, in and by themselves, no more constitute man than does a wax figure. It is our duty, therefore, to aid them to return to their original state as soon as possible, and cremation does this. The long preservation of the body by elaborate embalming methods is a custom born out of a sentiment which continues to associate the personality and the self with the physical shell, or else it is the result of certain religious interpretations. It is only those intangible elements, those conditions and characteristics which compose the ego and the personality which make the you when they have gone. It is best that the physical elements of the body be freed, as quickly as possible and with the utmost decency. Honorable viewers, it was a pleasure to have your company for today's Words of Wisdom. Coming up next is The Real Love, a musical that unites hearts, part 6 of a multi-part series. 
right after noteworthy news. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for more uplifting programming. May we all know true oneness of the heart's universal peace and brotherly love on earth in God's mercy. Our programs offer many languages. Please visit suprememastertv.com forward slash schedule and suprememastertv.com forward slash WOW. Heaven is watching. Stop worrying.